Boker Tov Givrin. Let's try that again. Boker Tov Givrin. Now, who knew what I said in the third word when I said Boker Tov Givrin? Any idea? Just by context, what do you think it might be? Not class, not students, not today. Gentlemen. Gentlemen, Givrin. It's an Aramaic word, actually. And uh, so that's the way it comes out. And if I would say, Mash Shlom Kim, how are you going to respond to that? Mash Shlom Kim. You could say, Tov, Toda. Mash Shlom Kim is, how are all of you? All right? So, Mash Shlom Kim. No Toda? No thank you? <laughs> you guys take the shortcut, don't you? <laughs> Let's just get right to it. Tov. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, well, we'll get the pleasantries taken care of as we go along. All right. The thing we want to do today uh, is to try in this third week to wrap up everything concerning the consonants and the vowels and to review syllabification so that you can perform the uh, workbook exercise number four where you'll be doing uh, the dividing of syllables on words to turn in on Tuesday. So that's where we're going today. Let's begin first of all then by reviewing the vowels, going over them one more time, listen carefully to their sounds, Listen carefully to their names. One of the keys, as I mentioned in the last class hour for Hebrew, is that you must learn the names correctly, the Hebrew names correctly. Because the Hebrew names are not only the clue for proper pronunciation, they are also going to be the clues as we begin to work through the process of Hebrew grammar. Everything you learn, you need to learn the correct pronunciation because if you know the name, you win the game. You've got it. If you don't know the name, if you have it incorrectly remembered or pronounced, it's going to cause confusion at later stages in learning the language. So that's another reason why we're emphasizing this. The first vowel is called what? Patak. Remember, it's the ah sound, patak. Don't say patak. That's what you hear when you go online and you go through the exercises there. That's what you hear from some Hebrew teachers. Uh, that's modern pronunciation that makes no distinction between this A-class vowel and the other A-class vowel. But the Masoretes devised the two separate vowel forms to indicate that distinction and to preserve the distinction. And they did that for some reasons. One is that if we don't recognize the distinction, it will cause confusion in certain word forms and their meanings. So we have to maintain this. So this is patak. It's an a ah sound. This vowel is called what? Comets. Notice the ah sound, comets. This is the different A-class vowel. You have a, ah, you have ah. These are the two A-class vowels. The third vowel here is what? Comets hay. Comets hay. It is the uh, full letter vowel. All right? The olive is provided there on the screen only to show you the position of the vowel pointing. That's the only purpose for that. And what you want to see is what's in black there, the comets and the hay. These will, this will always be at the end of a word when you have this. It will not occur internally to a word. This will only be when the hay is final that you'll have this comet's hay, and it'll be a longer ah sound. Instead of saying father, it's father. It's just a little bit longer. And then you have this vowel, the little triple dot cluster. What did I say was the meaning of its name? Grape cluster. Grape cluster. And what's its name? Segol, segol, and it's the e eh sound, just like you have in se, segol, all right? And then this E class vowel is the longer one. Tseve, tseve, make certain you have that A in there, tseve, okay? And that's its pronunciation. 
And then we move to the longest E-class vowel, and what do we call it? Tsereyod. It's the full letter vowel. Now this vowel, full letter vowel, can occur internally to a word as well as at the end of a word. All right, so don't confuse the comet's hay situation with the other full letter vowels. The other full letter vowels can all occur internally to the word, but comet's hay is always final. It's the one that is the exception. All right, and this has the A sound, but it's a little bit longer. Uh, and you'll notice that especially when it is at the end of a word, it will often be longer. And uh, we'll go through some other situations with it too in the future. All right, this single dot under a letter is called what? Hedek. Hedek. Okay, the Hedek. And it's the I class vowel. And this is called? Hedek Yod. Hedek Yod. All right, it's the long letter, that's the full letter vowel with the yod, and the yod is silent, just as it was in the tsere yod. This vowel has three dots, it's not the segol, it is called kibbutz, kibbutz. And make certain, don't say kibbutz, all right? It's not boots, it's butz, okay? Kibbutz, kibbutz. It's the short u vowel. And there's a very slight distinction. Sometimes it's difficult to hear. And sometimes, actually, in uh, the transcription of ancient Hebrew, such as the Dead Sea Scrolls, a wow is sometimes given as a vowel letter for the kibbutz, which really represents a shurek. And that also indicates that the sounds of them were very, very close, even in ancient times. And this letter is called? Shurek. Now, note that this is a full letter vowel. Therefore, this is not wu or vu, if you use modern pronunciation. That's, the wow is not a consonant here. The wow is not a consonant here. When, uh, we, uh, when I returned your exercises to you, uh, when you did Zephaniah 3, 8, and you identified the letters in their first occurrences. Many of you put a number six over the shurik that you saw because you were thinking, well, that's the first wow. But in reality, that is not a consonant. This is a vowel, not a consonant. So you actually had to go to Yahweh later in the line to find the first consonantal use of the wow. Uh, you'll note that I did not subtract any points for it, although I did mark it for you and show you and give you the reason why, that the shurik is not a consonant. So keep that in mind. This is not a consonant. Now, there will occur times when you will have a form in the Hebrew that has a wow with a dot in its bosom, and it will be a consonant, but you'll know that because below it will be a vowel. Below it will be a vowel. No Hebrew letter can take more than one vowel. There's only one vowel per Hebrew letter. And so if you have a wow with a dot in it like this, and you have a vowel under it or over it like a holum or a hirik, a pathic, a comets, a segol, a tsere, then you know that it's a consonant rather than the shurik. So that's how you tell the difference between the two. All right, and its pronunciation is oo. This vowel is called holum, holum. Okay, notice the o sound, holum. And it is both short and long, depending on context. And this is the full letter uh, vowel called holum wow, holum wow. You give the full name for it, holum wow. Notice we don't have a name like that for shurek. Although shurek uses the wow as a vowel letter, uh, it is not called shurek wow, but this is called holum wow. This vowel is different. It follows rules in which it has to be in a closed and unaccented syllable. We call it what? Comets hatuf. Comets hatuf. Sometimes you'll see it called Kametz Hatof. 
and that's because sometimes it's a, from an original U-class vowel, sometimes it's from an original O-class vowel, and so those who want to be real technical will name it accordingly uh, with regard to its origin, because this vowel, the Kamitz Hatuf, uh, represents a vowel that has been changed to this. In other words, the way the word has been inflected has created a change on this vowel to where it has been reduced in its sound. What do, we, do I mean by that? Turn to page 28 of your uh, textbook there and you'll see at the top of the page a vowel chart, all right? A phonetic triangle. And if you look at that chart, you begin down in the lower left-hand corner and you have the hyric and the way this works is that as you pronounce the sounds from the bottom left going to the peak of the pyramid and then coming back down the other side you begin with an E sound and then A, E, A and if you pronounce that and pay attention or look in a mirror and watch the corners of your mouth as you go up the pyramid the corners of your mouth gradually go out to where finally the pathak has your corners of your mouth at the furthest extent and yet your lips are close together. That's why the Masoretes gave it that form. It is depicting, it is picturing the mouth as it is being pronounced. So you have E, A, E, A. And you watch that and your corners of the mouth go out. Then you come down the other side and your mouth begins to round. The, your lips round it. You go from a to a to o to u. And notice how the tightest formation of your lips in a circle is when you pronounce the u sound as opposed to o or a. A, your lips are relaxing. A, you've got the corners of your mouth out. When you say a, the corners relax a bit, your mouth begins to round, the top and bottom lips begin to round out, and that's the rounding sound as you come down through there. A, A, O, U, 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 U. And U is the sharpest rounding, pursing of the lips. Now, why this coordination this way? How scientific were they in devising these symbols? and thinking of them, that's awful hard to say. We don't have any records that explain it to us as they began to go through this process. But it is very observable. And if you'll practice that in the proper pronunciation and you watch yourself in the mirror, you should see your mouth change in shape gradually as you go up the pyramid and come down the pyramid. As you go up, your, the corners of your mouth begin to go out further. As you come back down, your mouth r rounds and tightens. Okay? Then take a look at uh, another chart that is in your textbook found on page 39. On page 39, a chart is provided for you called a phonetic chart. It puts the vowels in their three different classes, the A class vowels, the I and E class vowels, and the O and U class vowels. The dark heavy double lines are not to be crossed when you have changes in the pronunciation of words due to inflection. Uh, for example, we say develop but we say development. Notice that develop, the E at the beginning, changes to D. It's like a schwa, development. We no longer say development. If you say that, you indicate that you're from a different region of the country or that uh, you speak English as a second language. There's different things that occur when you begin making these type of pronunciations. Uh, when you say nation, but we say national. Notice how the A changed sounds. That's a progression of the vowels that are changed due to the adding of additional syllables on a word that draw the accent 
to a different part of the word. And when the accent changes, the pronunciation changes. We don't say national, although I did have a professor that always said national. And, it, and we all laughed at him because it was just so odd. You just didn't hear people pronouncing words that way, you know. And he'd say, you're, you're a rational being. Rational? You know, that's, that doesn't, it's rational. But uh, you see, he wasn't making those changes along the way. Now that could be peculiar to a particular area of the country because there's dialectical differences in pronunciation. And it could be due to just a person refusing to accept the norms of pronunciation and being a stickler for a way that he wants to pronounce it because that's got to be right, you know. But the same thing happens in Hebrew. When you add suffixes or prefixes to the word or you lengthen it in any way to where the accent changes its position, then the vowels change. When the vowel changes, you keep the vowel within the same class. You can't change classes. For example, if you have a vowel that is a comments and you change it, you have to stay within the O and U class vowels. Uh, if you have, excuse me, the comets hatof there at the bottom. You have the comets hatof has to stay within the O and U class vowels. And you can go to a kibbutz. You can even go as far as having a holem. And you can go down to a comets, uh, a hatef comets on the lowest end. But it has to stay in the O and U class. You can't move it to an I or E class. A comets hatuf cannot become a segol. A segol cannot become a kibbutz. It stays within classes. But notice there's one place where you do not have that situation. Where a vowel change can cross over the boundaries of vowel classes. That's where you have the hirik and the pathak. The hirik can change to a pathak and the pathak can change to a hirik in certain situations. So that's the only place where you have that type of change. All other changes take place within those vowel classes. And that's why the heavy lines and why these are set up. And so as you look at that chart, the reason for providing that chart is so you can see the way that you have the combinations, you have the compound vowels, the compound half vowels on the left, the simple half vowel, notice, is the same in all three. All three classes, the simple schwa is the same. And that's part of the reason we know that the compound schwa would also be pronounced identically because it stays within that class and the class has as a short schwa value just the same as a schwa, it's all up. And then you have a deflected value that does not exist in the A class, but does exist in the I and E and the O and U. The pure vowel, notice, are the short vowels. You might ask, well, why is that called the pure vowel? And that's because the uh, uh, people that are working with phonology of biblical Hebrew have hypothetically decided on the basis also of some of the Masora and some of the discussion of the older he Hebrew grammarians, which are actually Arab-speaking people that wrote the first Hebrew grammars, and uh, Arabic. And uh, so they looked at all those, and they've, they've determined that this is what was, could have been, anyway, the original vowel. And then you have the tone-long vowel. By tone-long, we mean the pure vowel, when it's in an accented syllable, becomes long. So tone and accent are used synonymously in the description. So when we say tone long, it means it's accented long. When the accent is on it, it's going to be long. That's why here on okla, the comets is not a long vowel, it's a short vowel. And it's a short vowel by being deflected to the short sound. And that short sound is because it's not accented. It's in a closed, unaccented syllable. So it's going to be a shorter sound. And then you have the pure are the full letter vowels. The comets he, the hirek yod, and the shurek. And then the diphthongs, 
fascinatingly, that Seve Yod is considered a diphthong by these phonologists. It's still a full letter vowel, but they, they're claiming that it actually partakes of a dual representation. They hypothesize that it's not only the sound of the Seve vowel, but actually may have ended with the consonantal sound of a Y. And uh, how would we think of that? Well, when we spell the word they, T-H-E-Y, we represent that same thinking in many ways. That the long A sound, we even notice, if you notice the way we pronounce it in English, our jaw constricts slightly, comes closer when we get to the end, as though we were going to start to say you. Say you and notice where your teeth are, and then say they and notice where your teeth are. You see how it changes. It's almost as though you're saying they, ye, T-H-E, and then Y-I. And so the same thing happens in English. And so one school of thought is that this diphthong theory here in this chart uh, is an application of Western, perhaps even English pronunciation in the in interpretation of classical Hebrew pronunciation. So you won't always see that classified as a diphthong. The same is true of the O, because the O then is almost as though it were an O and W. Uh, we say ow, uh, where we have the W like that in our spelling and pronunciation. Uh, to, to the Hebrew here, the O may have been that way. It's not just O without any change, but O to where you almost begin to say, oh, wow, all right? That's the type of situation that's involved. So that's why you have the chart, just to show you the classifications and let you know that as words add syllables to them and the accent shifts, when you have a change in vowels, the vowels will remain in the same class. They'll remain the same class. So when you look at a word and you say, but wait a minute, I learned this in the lexical form this way. Why did it change? What has it changed from? Then you look at only that class of vowels to find out, except when it comes to the hyric and pathak. Okay? Scott? The comma te, we identify that because it's at the end of the word followed by hey. Is that what makes... No, I didn't it, have that it, before. It's at, the, it's at the end of a word. You have a footnote down there at the bottom that tells you about that. Uh, the footnote number, I think, what is it, 63? Yes, we'll explain that to you. That's comments, hey. And then also, what's a diphthong? Is that something I should know? I diphthong is a combination of two letters, sometimes two uh, vowels, sometimes two consonants, sometimes a vowel and a consonant. Like A-W is a diphthong. And uh, some even call uh, G-H a diphthong. But there's also, today, there's far more technical terms being used to differentiate those different classes where you have a uh, vowel plus a consonant or you have two consonants or uh, any, any of the combination of those are two vowels. There's different terms being used today and kids are taught different things in the schools. But we're just going to stick with diphthong. It's simplified, uh, perhaps not as technical term. It's just a combination of two sounds or two uh, forms. Okay? All right. Anyone else? Yes. Scott. Just to, to clarify, you were mentioning under the tone long. Yes. Similar to, I wrote down accent, but I think that's wrong. Not similar, same as. Same as. Tone, the, tone means accent. Okay, so that would be the accented syllable? The accented syllable, correct. The tone long vowels are found in accented syllables, correct. Okay? Yes? Just a couple examples of, of that on accent. Just, just so right, but you have it right here. For example, okla, that comments is not in an accented syllable, the first one. The second one at the end is in an accented syllable. Therefore, it is tone long. Okay? That's the comments hatuf. Okay? Uh, that's you, comments hatuf is the comets occurring in a closed, unaccented syllable, and it represents an original O or an original U. And therefore, it's called a comets hatuf or comets hatof, and it's pronounced as the O in God, so that it is not A 
as in comets. It's not O as in Holum. It's not U as in uh, Shurik. It has a form that is comets, but because the type of syllable it occurs in, it is not a comets. It is a comets hatuf. Okay? And so you have to pronounce this as okla, not akla, but okla. Ok, ok, not ok, not ook, but ok, okla. Okay? David? We will find long vowels in accented syllables that are, well, no, excuse me. You'll find long vowels in unaccented syllables. Okay? There will be long vowels in unaccented syllables. And there will be short vowels in accented syllables, which goes back to our old maxim for every rule. There is what? An exception. And we'll be learning those and what happens. The Hebrew has different ways of handling those. General, general rule. Tone long vowels are accented vowels. And long vowels are normally accented vowels. Okay? All right? All right. Now, then we go to the half vowels. We have the schwa. Most of schwa belongs to all three classes. All three classes have the schwa in it on that chart that you have on page 39. Then we have the compound schwas. They're called compound because there are two parts. They are composite. You have the schwa on the right hand side and then you have the short vowel of the A class in this case, the patek, the short vowel of the E class, the segol, hatif segol, and then you have a short vowel of the O and U class, which is the comets hatuf, then is placed here. But instead of calling it a hatif comets hatuf, it's just simply called a hatif comets. Because the shortest sound that you can have for the O and U class vowels and still be a vowel, a full vowel, is the comets hatuf. The shortest vowel in the I and E class vowels that you can have and still have a full vowel is the segol. And the shortest vowel that you can have in the A class vowels and still have a full normal vowel is the pathic. And so the shortest regular vowels are combined with the schwa to form then the hatif vowels, the compound schwas. The hatif comets is not an A class vowel. That's why it is transliterated with a superscript O because it is directly related to the comets Chatuf. All right? And if you go back to page 39 and you look at the chart, notice as you go across there that you have the pathic in the first line and over on the far left, the shortest form of the pathic is the hatif pathic. And you look in the I and E and the shortest form of the vowel, because you have the longest on the right end, the shortest on the left end, the shortest full vowel, not half vowel, the shortest full vowel is not hirik, but the segol. And so therefore the segol is used to form the compound schwa. And then if you go up the O and U class, you begin at the longest end. The longest is the holum while, then the shurik, then a holum, then the kibbutz, and then the comets chatuf. That's why it's transliterated with an O with a little circumflex over it, okay, the, or brev, excuse me, a brev over it. And that then is used in the combination of the hatef comets. All right? Everyone clear on that? Why that's used with an O and not an A? It's, it belongs to the O and U class. The Scott? Term, the transliteration for hatef versus hatu? Yes. Um, you that written for us? I'm sure there's somewhere. Well, you got it right there, number one. And number two, you have it back in the table of uh, the vowels in chapter two. On chapter two, under vowel pointings, page 26, 
You're given there the uh, forms of the uh, regular vowels and uh, then the comet satuf is left for later over here. When we talked about the comet satuf, see where does that come? That comes page 27. 27? Did I get it right? There we go. No? Oh yes, last one, excuse me. Yes, the very last one. Yes. And all you have there is you're given the sound of it. You're not given the... Uh, Trans, well, the transliteration is, is in the chart on page 26, excuse me. Page 26, it's in the chart. You look under the class of O, and you come across there, you have Comets Hatuf with an O with a uh, brev over the top of it, right there. Bottom of the column, under short vowels. Notice you have a column of short vowels, and you have three columns of long vowels in that chart on page 26, in the middle of the page. So it is given for you there. What isn't given for you in that chart are the uh, half vowels. Okay? All right? So put the chart on page 26 together with the chart on page 39. You'll find that the, the uh, transliterations are identical in what's provided. Okay? We, on page 39, however, we did not, again, supply you with the names. You have to supply those yourself now. Okay. Other questions? Those are good questions. Want to make certain everything's clear. Because if it's clear, it's easier to remember. And it's easier to get good grades when we go to the exam. Right? All right. So these three are the Hatev Pathak, the Hatev Segol, and the Hatev Comets. Those are the compound schwas, the combination forms, where you have the uh, schwa together with the other letters. Jeff? Yes, you Jeff. The for the right. Do we need to know the transliteration? Which you will need to know transliterations for the exam, yes. For your exam, I'll just give you a brief preview right now. Your first exam is going to be primarily on your alphabet and the vowels. You should be able to write the Hebrew alphabet out in order from Aleph through Tau. You should be able to identify by name any of the letters and any of the vowels. And you should be able to transliterate any of them, providing the proper transliteration. Okay? We'll come back to that a little bit later. We have more to say about it. But that's the core of that first exam. It's right there. We'll also have a little bit of vocabulary. But uh, that's the main point. Okay? Scott? In the transliteration, one thing I, I don't have any in English, I, I've never even understood this, all the, the, the indications of long vowels and all. Should we go back and give ourselves a little education on that? Because it's really helpful, obviously, when we're reading when you do it. And I've, I only can do it when I'm copying. I don't know what they all mean necessarily. Should we? Okay. Well, first of all, I've given you the values in all the charts because I've given you word examples in English where you have that sound. And so that's really all you should need to do. Just go back over those. Just pay attention to those, right? And, and if you'll notice, when you have the brev over the top of something, that's your short sound. That's a short sound. And when you have the circumflex over something, that is the very long sound. In fact, as you're told uh, in, the, uh, in your textbook, these four are full letter vowels and you only find that circumflex over the full letter vowels. So this represents what? Sereyod. This represents Comets Hay. This represents Hirikyod. This represents Holom Wow. Whenever you have the circumflex over the top of the vowel, that represents the full letter vowel. In other words, the vowel plus the silent consonant that goes with it. All right? So that's very simple to remember. So this is Tsere Yod, Kamets He, Hirek Yod, and Holom Wow. And with the U, Shurek. These are full letter vowels. <coughs> All full letter vowels. Okay? 
All right, let's go on then. Let's review again the vocal schwa. We need to review these because for syllabification, you have to have these correctly understood. There are two kinds of schwa, vocal and silent. Vocal and silent. You must learn them because you need to be able to pronounce the words. You must learn them because they also make a difference later when we get into word formation and adding suffixes and prefixes. So if it's under the first letter beginning a syllable, and of course, when you begin a word, you're beginning a syllable, then it is vocal. So this is shamor. Everyone? Shamor. shamor. Okay, you have that sh in there. Shamor. The accent's still on the last part. This is only one syllable because remember, half vowels can never make a syllable. They're also following full vowel letters. So if we have the holum wow here and following it, we have the constant mame, then this schwa is a schwa that is vocal. Why? Because the full letter vowels force the syllable to be open. Full letter vowels, these four, shuri, kolom, wow, hirik, yod, kamets, he, and sere, yod, cannot be closed normally. Now there are a few situations where they, be, where they get closed, like in the uh, word between, bane. Bane is a tsere yod, full letter vowel, in a closed syllable. But it's the only syllable, you see. If it's internal to the word, it resists that closing. So, show marim, you see, the show is not shom. The mame does not close that syllable. The whole wow up here in shomrim then requires that that syllable maintain an open status and the schwa under the constant following it becomes vocal and becomes part of the next syllable. The schwa here and the mame are not the end of the first syllable, they're the beginning of the second syllable going from right to left as you read through. All right? Now when you form the syllabification of that, you begin at the end of the word and you look for full vowels and you begin to mark them off and when you come to a schwa, then you ask the question, is this following a full letter vowel like holum wow? And if it is, then you put the line through the word then ahead of that, to the right of it, so that the schwa is the beginning of the syllable, and since it's the beginning of the syllable, then it is vocal. It's vocal. So it's show marim. Okay? Show marim. It's not shom rim. It's show marim. Everyone say it. Show marim. Remember, the access has to come on the end, so don't get too caught up in the show part, okay? Show marim. Everyone? Show marim, okay? And then when you have two schwas back to back in the middle of a word, then the first one is always silent and the second one is always vocal. So in this word, it's yish, not yisha, okay? It's yish maru. Everyone? Yish maru. Again? Yish maru, two schwas, back to back, in the middle of the word. The first one is always what? Silent. Silent. The second one is always vocal. vocal. All right. Now remember that's in the middle of the word. Then when you have a doubling dogish, here the teth is not a bagad kafath letter, so it's obvious that this dogish is the doubling dogish. So when you have the schwa with a doubling dogish, again that says that schwa is vocal. So it's kit tali, uh, kit talu, excuse me, I almost put the, another word in there. Kit talu, kit talu, everyone? Kit talu, kit talu, double the sound of the teeth. kit talu, all right? 
And then when you have two identical consonants, like two lamas together here in the middle of this word, the first consonant in that pair where they're identical, both lamas here in this case, then that schwa is vocal. And this one's easy because you know hallelujah, right? You don't say hallelujah, you say halla, hallelujah, hallelujah, all right? And you're pronouncing the Hebrew correctly when you do that, all right? It's a vocal schwa. Why? Because there are two lamads back to back, and so the schwa under the first of those identical consonants is vocal. Question, John? Why don't the lamads in that one rely and take a, a double dogish? Because if it did, it'd be a different word in the Hebrew. It'd be pronounced the same, perhaps, but uh, no, in fact, let me back up. It would not be pronounced the same because if you doubled those, uh, then you'd have hal lalu. Hal lalu. And this is, this is ha lalu. Ha lalu. Notice the difference? It's not hal lalu. It's ha lalu. Right. Okay? If you put a doubling dogish in the lamad, then you have to put a lamad at the end of the preceding consonant, or at the end of the preceding uh, syllable. So this is ha lalu, not hal lalu. All right? And uh, English, uh, as a matter of fact, when we spell hallelujah or hallelu, Sometimes you see it spelled with two L's, which is actually uh, hallelujah. I have to think about that, how it works out in the English, if it works out properly in the English. But uh, anyway, the point being here, that is a vocal schwa. Okay? Yes? Can go back to the kitaloo? Sometimes yes. the pronunciation, when we drag it out, it's hard to say it right. I mean, you almost, with a T, you almost have to... Do you actually stop and then start again, or do you just no? I'm doing that. I'm doing that only for to make certain that you're actually knowing that there's two T's here. So you really just kind of drag yeah. that right. just a little bit. Right, right. Kitalu. You you when you pronounce it purely, quickly, you can't really hear the two T's. But you've got to remember that there are two T's there because if you don't remember there are two T's there, it's going to foul up your understanding of the word and its formation. Okay? So regardless of whether you can hear it in pronunciation, you've got to remember that's doubled. All right? Everyone clear on that? It's a very good point that Scott's making there. That when I pronounce it slowly, kit to loo, uh, it, it makes the pronunciation really kind of artificial. And I'm doing that for the purpose of emphasizing in your minds that when you have the doubling doggish, it doubles that. Now, in actual quick reading and pronunciation, we may not be able to distinguish or hear that doubling, but we've got to understand it's there. Otherwise, we're not going to get it right. All right? It's kind of like learning how to spell kitten. Uh, we say kitten, we don't say kit ten. You say kitten. But you know that if you spell kitten this way, that someone's going to give you a bad time about it because that's not proper. Right? Because in English then, in, in actuality, that becomes chitin, you see. The two T's are what tell us that that I is a short sound in a closed syllable, just like what we're talking about in Hebrew, a short vowel and a closed syllable. It's a symbol, it's a signal of how you pronounce the word and why the vowels are the way they are. And you've got to learn how to spell it correctly. As in Hebrew, you've got to learn when it's doubled to put that doubling doggish in there. It'd be as much, to leave that, that doggish out of uh, kitalu is as much a crime as to leave the T out of kitten. Okay, the second T. All right. Let's go on then. Let's talk about the silent schwa. Yes, James. On page 37, you have a number five there. Is that a continuation of one of the other rules? On uh, 37, number 5. That's where you have the doubling uh, uh, of the uh, dogish. The only reason that's given to you 
It's, notice it's identical. And the explanation says it's, the reason for this is because you have a Bagad Kafath letter. And so I gave an example without the Bagad Kafath letter in number four. Number five is an example with a Bagad Kafath letter. That's the only difference between those two. The rule is identical on four and five. It's just that we had to also explain that when you have a Bagad Kafath letter, that doggish then not only doubles, it hardens. Okay, that's the only reason for it. But it's exactly the same situation of the vocal schwa as in number four. Correct. Good. I'm glad you asked. Yes. How would you break Kyle? That down? <clears throat> as far as like noting um, the syllable, the syllables on that, since it is a doubling. Does that make sense? Like, um, so if like we're drawing a line in between the, the okay, letters. Okay, well, we're going to get to slapification later if you can oh, wait okay. till then. Sure. Okay, because we're going to cover that because you have to know that. You have to know the answer to your question to do the exercise that's due on Tuesday. Okay, so we will cover that. All right, so we'll come back to that. It's a good question and one that I intend to answer today. All right, any other questions while we're here? Okay, let's go to silent schwa. Let's review this. Remember, a silent schwa is under a letter closing a syllable. Vocal schwa opens a syllable. Silent schwa closes a syllable. In other words, the vocal schwa begins a syllable. The silent schwa ends a syllable. Okay? When you end a syllable with a consonant, you close it. And when you do that, the schwa that's under that consonant is silent. Yish more. It's not yish more. It's yish more. Yish more. No sound between the sheen and the main. It's silent. Yish more. Everyone? Yish more. Okay? Yish more. And then following an accented syllable. And here you have a tsere. And you have an accent on it. And because the tsere is accented, then it is long, but in this case, it's going to be a silent schwa. So it's lake na. Okay? Lake na. Everyone? Lake na. And I'll have to explain that when we get to accents later. But the reason for the accent here is to give a reason why the tsere can be put in a closed syllable. All right? I'll have to explain that later when we get to accents. And that'll be next week. But uh, for now, just remember that if the preceding vowel is accented, that syllable is accented, the schwa that immediately follows is silent. Okay? It's silent. Now remember in shomrim, rim, Marim is where we have marim is where we have the accent, not on show. So it's a vocal schwa. If the accent were on the show, if it was show marim, then it would be vocal. It, it would be, it'd be uh, silent. Excuse me, shom rim. It'd be shom rim. So if it's not accented, then it's vocal. Show marim. So. Those two are going to cause confusion a lot of times. And by the time you finish one year of Hebrew, 90% of the time, you'll be pronouncing it correctly when you look at a word. Okay? By the time you finish three semesters of Hebrew, hopefully you'll be doing it 100% of the time. But don't expect to do better than 50% in the first semester because it takes a long time to get used to that distinction and watch it. And part of it is just learning the pronunciation of words in Hebrew and the way they pronounce them. And pretty soon, you're not even thinking about these rules. You're only trying to remember the sound and to imitate. Okay? It's like when you learned English. How many of us learned all the rules for how accents change vowels before we started pronouncing English? Any of you? No, you were speaking English before you even went to school. You didn't learn these things. And that's part of the thing, what happens here is in a class like this where you learn the reasons because we're trying to bring you up to high school level in a language in a semester or two rather than leaving you in the preschool 
stage of language. Uh, we have to give these explanations to so get all the classes and phonetics and everything else and grammar immediately. And sometimes we allow that to so cloud our minds in trying to remember all these rules and everything else that we allow it to interfere in our just listening and learning the language. That's one of the balancing acts, del delicate balancing acts. When I took biblical Hebrew, we had to learn all of the phonetic rules for the changes in vowels and all the things, the terms that you do not find in this textbook were what we had to memorize. We talked about attenuation of vowels, eliding of vowels, uh, uh, lengthening of vowels, uh, shortening of vowels. And we had all these vowel change rules we had to memorize. We leave these out in here because you don't need to know all those things to learn the language. And we give, us, we give the minimum. <laughs> and part of the minimum is learning the rules for the pronunciation of schwa's. Okay? Questions? Jan? Last word, uh, the tere is a long. It's a long vowel. And this is why the... And it is accented. So, and it's not closed. Not it's closed. not closed. It is closed, excuse me. It is closed because this is a silent schwa, lake, na. It closes it. And as I said, we'll have to wait till we get to accents for me to give a full explanation of that. Okay? For now, just try to remember it. <laughs> That a schwa following an accented syllable is silent. Okay? Try to ignore the vowel. Try to ignore that it's long. Try to ignore that long vowels are normally in open syllables. And just try to remember any accented syllable followed by a schwa, then that schwa is silent. Any schwa following an accented syllable is silent. Try to ignore the fact that that's a long vowel. Okay? That's all I want you to remember now. Schwa after an accented syllable is silent. Scott? There may not be a why, but if there is, it helps me. With the schwa, when, it, when it's silent, why, is there a reason it's there? Does it tell us any other information? It seems no. That's just the way the language is pronounced. It's just that way. But if it's silent, doesn't do anything. So I mean, it, it divides a syllable. It divides a syllable. Right. Okay. So it says it lake, not. Okay. Okay. That helps. Okay. All right. The vowelless final cough, the cough sophit, has a schwa in its bosom. That is a silent schwa, never vocal. It's not meleka. All right. It's melek. Melek. Okay, the schwa in the final kaf sofit, in the kaf sofit, is always silent. And when you have two schwas back to back at the end of a word, okay, if they're in the middle of the word and you have two schwas, what's the first schwa? Silent. The second schwa is? Okay, at the end of a word, if you have two schwas in the row, at the very end, they're both silent. They're both silent. So this is shamert, okay, everyone? Shamert, all right? The resh has no vowel, the tau has no vowel in pronunciation. You say, well, why do they even put the schwas in? Because the Masoretes made a rule that every consonant must have a vowel except a final consonant. And you say, well, couldn't they leave one of these schwas off then in that case? No because they made the rule too that this is one exception. That when you have the tau on the end, it's going to have the schwa under it. Okay? Yes? Is the schwa considered a vowel? It's a half vowel. It's a half vowel. It is a vowel, but it's a half vowel. Why is it called a half vowel? Because it cannot form a syllable by itself. It only has half of an authority. It has half a sound, in some cases silent, and then you half of a sound when it does have a sound, and it never forms a syllable on its own. Those are half vowels. Okay? And of course, back to back in the middle of the word, the first schwa is silent, the second one is vocal. We already have that in the reverse for the vocal schwa. 
All right, the pathac furtive, remember we talked about it, it's under final gutturals and it's pronounced ahead of that guttural, ruach. Now remember that it is not accented, you don't say ruach, it's ruach. You put the accent on the ru and the ach, you back off of the emphasis, okay? So everyone pronounce that together, ruach. Again, ruach. And then this is shamoach, okay? Shamoach. Why is the schwa vocal? Why is the schwa vocal on the second word? It starts the syllable or starts the word, so it's vocal. And it's shamoach. And this is a one syllable word because the schwa is a half vowel and cannot form a syllable. And the pathic, the final, when you have a final letter that is a guttural, the last letter of the word is a guttural and has a pathic under it. That is a half vowel. It is a half vowel. It's not treated as a regular vowel. It's the pathic furtive. And so it is not accented, does not receive the uh, accent, and it does not form a syllable by itself, and it's pronounced before that guttural, if the guttural has a sound. Yes? No, it's, it's, no it's, it takes an a sound. And that's why it's treated in the separate category from the schwas and the hatifs. It has the a sound, but it's not accented. So it's shamoa. Okay? And then here we have gavoach. All right, everyone? And it's gavoach. You have to kind of flutter the back of your throat a little bit because the hay here is not a silent hay. That's why you have a dot in it. And what did we say the dot is called in the final hay? Mapik. Okay, it's the mapik. So it has a little bit of guttural sound there. Not as guttural as the haith. If this were a haith, it would be gavoach. But here, it's gavoach. And there's a slight flutter in the throat to show it. And that's it. Barely heard. All right? Yes? And the second word, would that be um, one syllable? One syllable, one syllable, one syllable. All three are one syllable. Why are they one syllable? Because all three of them have only one regular vowel. Because a pathic furtive is a considered a half vowel. All right? The pathic furtive is considered a half vowel. Jeff? have a pathic and a holic? Excuse me, excuse me. That's right. Thank you for pointing that out. We have a comments there. The last word is a two syllable word. You have two regular vowels a holum and a comments. It's only the first two that are one syllable words. Thank you, Jeff. All right, someone's listening and learning. All right, we want to move on to uh, review syllabification so that you're able to do the uh, exercise number four that has to do with uh, the alphabet, half vowels, and syllables. We want to make certain that you're prepared for that and can perform everything you're asked. A summary then of syllabification. We went over this earlier, but I uh, want to go over it again. Only full vowels can form syllables. Now when I say full there, I'm not talking about long vowels. I'm not talking about full letter vowels. I'm talking about full vowel as compared to the half vowel. Okay? So sometimes we use terms that sometimes are difficult to distinguish. But in this context, we say full vowel. We're not saying full letter vowel. And we're not saying long vowel. We're saying a regular vowel, okay, like a pathak and a comets, but to the exclusion of half vowels, like schwa and the hatif pathic, etc., and uh, things like uh, the uh, furtive pathic. Only full vowels, only the regular vowels, only the normal vowels can form syllables. Half vowels cannot form syllables. That's the second part of it. That's the flip side. Half vowels cannot form syllables. When you're dividing syllables, don't start at the beginning of the word because things will get confused. You have to begin at the end of a word. Why? Because there are so many different rules and exceptions to rules regarding the dividing of words into syllables in Hebrew 
that if you begin at the beginning, you must know all of the other things, such as what are all the intensive forms of the verbs, so that you can understand for certain uh, the, uh, the occasion for certain forms. You, you don't, are not able to do that at this point, so you've got to start at the end and work through it logically. So when we start at the end of a word, like ele, we look for the first full vowel, meaning the first regular vowel, the first vowel that is not a half vowel, okay? So the first vowel that is not a half vowel is what here? And what is the second vowel that is not? All right, so we have two vowels that are not half vowels, therefore we're going to have two syllables. And every syllable must have a vowel. Okay, not a half vowel, but must have a vowel, a full vowel, a vowel that is not a half vowel, okay? Every syllable must have one vowel that is not a half vowel, okay? So there's one syllable for every vowel. Vowel being used there, opposite of half vowel, okay? So as we look at this word, what problem do we face? The Lamed has a doubling doggish in it. How do we know the Lamed has a doubling doggish and not a hardening doggish? It's not a Bagad Kafaf letter, so it has to be doubled. All right? Remember that the non doubling, the hardening doggish, occurs only in six letters. The Bagad Kafath. Everyone say Bagad Kafath. Bagad Kafath. If you remember that, then you've got the sounds. B, the bait. G, the ga is for the gimel. D, Bagad. The D is for the Daleth. And then we have K is the Kaf. And th, Fa is for the Pei. And they end it, th, Bagad Kafath. That's the Tau. So those are the six letters. So you look at this, you see a dogish. It's not a Bagad Kafath letter. This, is, this has the sound La. And La is not in Bagad Kafath. So this has to be a doubling dogish. So when you have a doubling dogish, you divide the word, okay? So as we look at that, your division is el le. Now how do you do that on your sheets when you're looking at it? The way you'll do it on your exercise, you have the word written this way, and to show the division, to divide it, you just go down on a slant through the middle of the letter like that, okay? That's how you divide it. That shows that the Slamid is being cut in half. You put your line right through the dogish. It's ale le. Okay? You don't divide it. And I'll put the green here for where you don't divide it. You don't divide it here. All right? Because you have a doubled constant, then one of those doubled constants goes with the preceding. Uh, syllable and one with the other. So you don't put the vertical line that way. You put the slanted line cutting the lamed in half and putting this vowel on this side because this vowel goes with this part. This vowel goes with this part. Okay? Any question on that? Do you understand that? All right, let's go to a more difficult situation. Uh, question, John? I do have a question on that word. Uh, when you have a divided, is there always you assume it, yes, because you, every consonant has to have a vowel, except a final consonant. And so it's assumed. But notice you're not rewriting it that way. That's just for the purpose of illustration and to tell you and show you what's happening here. And two schwas in the middle of a word are, what, the first is silent, the last is vocal. In this case here, what do you have? As you're looking at this, you divide it, you divide the Lamed, but you can't divide the Segol. You can't divide the Segol. So that means the first, the, the Segol, the vowel, goes with the last one. And so the previous Lamed then, that's hypothesized, 
you have to give it a silent schwa. You have to give it a silent schwa because you're not dividing the vowel. The only vowel that can be divided is the schwa itself. Okay? So if when you divide it that way, you don't divide the vowel that's under the, the doubled letter unless that vowel is a schwa. Okay? Good question. Okay, we begin with this one. We start at the end. Remember, we have a problem here. The, the, we have the schwa, the half vowel, the schwa cannot form a syllable by itself. All right? We've also learned another rule, that the schwa that follows an accented syllable is silent. Okay? So as we're looking at this, where does the accent come in this word? The end. So the first holem is not accented. If the first holem were accented, the schwa following it would be silent. That means this is vocal schwa. So we divide it by going ahead of the vocal schwa and we have two syllables because we have two vowels. We have, two, we have a holom wow and we have a holom. Those are the only two regular vowels here. Two syllables. And we divide that off because that schwa is a vocal schwa. And some of you, a few of you, may have had enough background, biblical background. You may have had a study in Genesis or you may have been listening very carefully uh, when Professor Essex was giving the survey of Old Testament and he talked about the division of the book of Genesis into the generations of, and he may have said, the Toledot. And if you were listening carefully and you caught it, he said Toledot, vocal schwa. And so as you look at this, you say, well, that looks very much, it sounds very much like what he was talking about. Well, that's an added bonus if you had a mind that could remember that. All right, that just helps you out. You just got one leg up one time. But that's the integration of everything you learn, you see. Everything we're doing here is integrated with other classes and other learning. So every time you hear a Hebrew word in another class, you know, keep that in mind because when you come across it later, then it's something that's not totally new. Okay? And you may have already forgotten that in the uh, survey course. How many of you had the OT survey? How many of you remember him mentioning Toledo? Okay, a few of you do. Good. Excellent. He would be pleased. I saw more hands up than I thought I would see. Yes. Uh, Jeff. Is it straight or slanted when we draw it? Is that other than when, when you're doing that one? When you're doing this one? You're going to divide it. that way because you're not dividing a letter okay good question when you can make a simple division just put a straight line between them. okay all right let's go to the next one we have Yaakov Yaakov the problem is that ayin with a hatef pathic now, why does the ayin have a hatif pathic instead of just a simple schwa? Guttural. It's a guttural. And what rule of the gutturals then are we talking about, Scott? They prefer A sounds. Mm, one more. That's part of this, but it's not the whole of it. What? They prefer compound schwas. They prefer compound schwas. And then because of what Scott said then normally they're going to prefer the A-class compound schwa, which is the pathic, the hot of pathic, all right? But the first thing to see is it's a, ayin is a guttural. Gutturals prefer compound schwa, so it's not going to keep a simple schwa normally. It will go to have a compound schwa. A compound schwa is always vocal. Compound schwa is always vocal. Vocal schwa's Begin or end syllables? Begin. 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 So you already got the answer, don't you? Of where we're going to go with this. You're going to put the division right there. Okay? It's ya akov. It's a vocal schwa, therefore it begins the syllable. 
Vocal schwas begin syllables. All you have to do when you see a schwa is ask yourself a question. Is this a vocal schwa or a silent schwa? And if you need to, go to your textbook to page 37 and page 38 and look at those two charts that give you the rules for vocal and silent schwas. Go through and identify which it is and then you've got your answer. Because a silent schwa finishes a syllable, ends it. And a vocal schwa begins a syllable. Okay? Silent ends, vocal begins. Everyone repeat, repeat it after me. Silent ends, vocal begins. Again, one more time. Silent ends, vocal begins. Keep that in mind. And anytime you see a schwa, whether it's a compound schwa or a simple schwa, you ask that question and you will have your answer for your syllabification very quickly, very quickly. All right? Then we have this situation. We have two schwas. And what's the rule concerning two schwas in the middle of the word? The first is silent. The second is vocal. Therefore, the first does what with a syllable? Ends, and the second begins. So that means we're going to put a line at least between those two schwas, you see. Because when we have two schwas in the middle of a word, the first is silent, the second is vocal. The silent ends, the vocal begins. So you put the line between the two. And then you keep going backwards and you've got the way done here. And this one I need to explain to you because it's one of those examples that uh, you're going to have... And that's Vayishnu. Vayishnu. Okay? Now, when you're going through and you're dividing this, oh, I'm sorry, I should, shouldn't have put that in red. Who's the one that has problems with red? John? Was that you? Who was it? Is it okay? You can see it? Okay, sorry about that. That's why I usually try to choose black to write with up here. All right, so these two schwas, we know that the silent ends, the vocal begins. So we're going to divide it right there. Because here you have the regular vowel, the full vowel, rather than a half vowel. The shurik is a full vowel. And these are half vowels, so they cannot form syllables by themselves. Here, this vowel, these two vowels are regular vowels. That's just an accent mark. And so the accent mark, you're going to ignore that. But you have a doggish in the yod. What kind of doggish is it going to be? Doubling, Doubling. why? Because, because it's not a bagad kafath letter. We don't have a, a yabagad kafath, right? <laughs> All right? So we're going to split this yod that way at an angle to show that this hirik goes here, the path goes there, one yod stays here, one yod goes there. Okay? Chad. Going back to the at, at Yes. Um, since there's three syllables, I'm confused on why. Not three syllables. I'm three, three vowels. I'm confused this on This is a half vowel. Even with the, uh, even with the, uh, a half It has a schwa with it, therefore it's a half vowel. Uh, okay. okay? It's only pronounced half. It's pronounced exactly the same as a schwa. All right? The hatif vowels are half vowels. They are not regular or full vowels. Okay, so anything with a schwa, compound or simple, is a half vowel. Okay? Yes? On the hidek, what is that line in front of it? Here? Yes. That's an accent. Oh, instead of the top, you put it on the bottom here? Correct. Accent it on the top. Well, accents occur all over the place. Oh, anywhere. Okay. Yeah. We haven't got to all of them yet. But that's just an accent. That, that simple vertical line next to a vowel is an accent. And it goes on the left side of the, of the vowel. So it's connected with a pathic, not with the hyric. Okay? We'll talk more about that later. All right. We look at this one. What are the problems? Schwa's. And we have to determine what about these schwa's? 
whether they're vocal or silent. What about the last schwa? Silent. silent. Why is it silent? Any schwa in the bosom of a cough so feet is silent. What about the other one? How do you know it's vocal? It's not following an accented syllable. Okay? It's not following an accented syllable. Therefore, it's going to be vocal rather than silent. And so, therefore, it's Tim Loke. That didn't say it right, did it? This is one of those exceptions. Oh, you don't pronounce the uh? No. It's silent here. It closes. Okay? So you have, how do you figure this one? Well, actually, I probably shouldn't even put it in here because to, to figure this one, I've got to explain to you verb formation. And that is, this is a verb, and it's a verb prefix. And the verb prefix is going to be followed in this particular verb conjugation with a silent schwa. And that's way ahead of where we're at right now. So you just have to take my word for it now. You say, well, what, about, what if I run across a situation like that in the exercise, in the worksheet? Anything that is in there like that is a freebie. Because I can't expect you to know that at this point. All right? So we'll just have to let that go. But that's the explanation. Yes? Where's the vowel for the second syllable? The whole. Oh, I didn't. To the left of the ascended part of the lamid. When you put a holum with a lamid, it goes to the left of the ascended part at the top. Okay? Good question. That's why you have to have good glasses or good eyes. <laughs> and sometimes in some printed forms, you can't even see it. It doesn't show up very well at all. All right, what about this word? One syllable because it has only one regular vowel. Okay? The hotif pathak cannot form a syllable by itself because it is a half vowel. Now, what about this one? This is another problem, the same as the first one. Vocal schwa begins a syllable, doesn't close. So that's an easy one. Vocal schwa here begins a syllable, doesn't close. The problem is the schwa under the sheen. And it's going to be silent because this is a verb prefix that it's with. All right? Because in looking at that, and there's, there's one other way of figuring this one. See, a little bit easier than the other one up there. Because a hirik can be long and it can be short. And if you take it as short, it definitely is in a closed syllable. And that, it can, that turns out to be short up there. But this one, the segol, is a short vowel. Remember your chart where it shows it. It is a short vowel. Okay? The hirik can be short or long. It's definitely long if it's hirik yod. But here, the segol is definitely short. So a short vowel is going to be closed syllable. All right. Then this one, as we look at it, there's all of our half vowels identified. That one is a vocal schwa because it's a compound schwa. And then we have the same situation here, a hirik that's going to prove to be a uh, short vowel because it's a verb prefix. And the lamid is vocal, so it's going to begin there. And this would be pronounced lahish tahawa. Tachaot. Wahish Tachaot. Yes, John. Can you pronounce the third one? Sure, let's pronounce all of them. Tim Loke is the first one. Tim Loke. Everyone? Tim Loke. The second one is Halom. Say it again. Halom. Okay. And the next one is Wahesh Lachaka. Okay, now don't say we'll esh la ka ka. 
It's Welesh la ka. Okay? Welesh la ka. And then lahish tahot. Hachot. And here you have chaot. All right? Lahish tahot. Okay? Now, let's do something else here. We have five minutes left. I want to go over the exercise in a minute here. Remember your exercise on Zephaniah 3.8 because it, can, it is the one verse in Scripture that contains all of the Hebrew alphabet uh, plus the final forms. Let's read it. I'll read one word at a time and you pronounce it after me. Okay? Lakain. Lakain. Hakuli. Hakuli. Neum Yahweh. Neum Yahweh. Leom. Leom. Kumi. Kumi. Laad. Laad. Ki. Ki. Mishpati. Mishpati. Leasof. Leasof. Goyim. Goyim. Lekav Si. Lekav Si. Mam Lakot. Mam Lakot. Lishpok. Lishpok. Elehem. Elehem. Zami. Zami. Do you know something in Zami? Know something that doesn't look right? No compound schwa under the guttural ayin. Okay? That tells you that there are exceptions. And ayin happens to be one of the possible exceptions of having a regular schwa under it. Okay? Kol. Cheron. Cheron. Api. Api. Ki. Ki. Baesh. Baesh. Kin ati. Te akel, te akel, kol haaretz, kol haaretz. Now, did you hear something in that last pronunciation? Kol haaretz. What did you hear? Kol haaretz. Kamets hatuf, not call. It's not kal ha'aretz. It's not ah. It's not a comets. It is a comets in a closed, unaccented syllable. Okay? Because when you have that bar between there that looks like a hyphen up there at the top, that's called a makaif. That joins two words together and indicates they are to be pronounced as one word. And so the only accent is the accent next to the comets under the aleph. And so you pronounce those two, kol ha'aretz, as one word. And there's only one accent on the ah in ha'aretz. And so that means that kol, the comments there at the beginning of the word, is in a closed, because the lamed closes it, unaccented syllable. So it's the comments hatuf. So you pronounce it kol, like K-O-L, like the O in God, not the O in whole. Okay? Kol ha'aretz. Okay? Practice that. You have it in your textbook. Practice reading it. Try to get to where you recognize the letters and the vowels. And if you foul up a little bit on whether a schwa is vocal or silent, that's not a great concern right now. The real concern is, do you recognize all the other vowels and give the proper sound? And do you recognize the consonants and give the proper sound? That's the main thing. So practice that. Let's take the, the uh, workbook and turn to uh, exercise number four. I want to go over this before we leave here in one minute for chapel. Uh, part A in exercise four is to indicate which of the following statements is true or false by circling. Please don't underline. Please don't put lines through or cross out. Circle the correct one. Circle the correct one, just as you have there in the example. And if the answer is false, then correct the statement to make it a true statement. 
When two schwas occur back to back in the middle of a word, the first is always vocal and the second is always silent, is false. How do you correct it? You put a line through vocal, write silent above it, put a line through silent, write vocal above it, and now it reads cl correctly. That's what I want you to do with each of these statements. Is that clear for everyone? All right. Then look at the next page. On B, circle all silent schwas. Use the chart you have in your textbook on page 38 that identifies sh silent schwas to help you identify all of them. And part C, use the chart on page 37 in the textbook to help you identify all the vocal schwas and to circle them. And then divide all the following words into syllables. And I gave examples of division there, but you're not going to push them apart that way. You're going to do this type of thing. You're just going to leave the words as they are and put the lines where they belong. Okay? And then part E is to read aloud these exercises. And uh, what I've given you there is to tell you that the accent above is used to indicate the accent on a syllable. And then words employing the schwa and furtive pathic. Think about which ones are silent, which ones are vocal. Furtive pathic is always vocal. Uh, it's always a half vowel and it never has the accent on it. The furtive pathic is only under a final guttural at the end of a word. Uh, words with letters that look like baith and cough. Try to keep the distinction here between them. And uh, differences between the noon and gimel, the resh and daleth, the, the hay and the chayf, the zayin and the wow, the samik and the maim, the sheen and the seen. Those are all vocal exercises from the middle of the page on 14 to 15 there where you're dealing with those. So there's no written work there. But I want you to do those exercises. I want you to read them. Because next week on Tuesday when we come to class, the first thing we're going to do is to go through the worksheet. And when we get to this part, I'm just going to start around the room and ask you to pronounce the words and see how you're doing. It's kind of like a vocal quiz, but I'm not going to be grading you. I'll just be helping you, correcting you, and making certain you get the correct pronunciation. But work on it ahead and try to figure these out yourself and get the pronunciation. Now, in order to do that, for what you use in class, I don't want you to have notes on there that in English letters tell you how to pronounce it. All right? I want you to be able to read the Hebrew and the Hebrew alone. So keep the sheet clean here. If you want to mark it up, get another, make a photocopy of it or something, or copy it onto a card or another sheet by hand. But uh, that's it. Uh, one, one other thing I need to make clear before we uh, uh, dismiss so that you under, can prepare yourself a little better for the uh, exam coming up. Uh, when we talked about transliteration and we talked about names, if you look back very quickly on page 26, page 26, you see the chart in the middle of page 26 where the names of the vowels are given. Those names are the official names representing the Hebrew names and they're transliterated. Do not memorize the transliterated forms of those names. Memorize the simplified spelling of the names, which are down below. Notice the technical name column has the transliteration. The simplified name is what I want you to remember. All right? The simplified name is what I want you to remember. And when we talk about transliteration, I want to know that you know the transliteration value of the vowels and of the uh, uh, letters. And so that's talking about what you see in transliteration on page 21, for example. Page 21, right-hand column, transliteration, transliteration. Okay, right-hand column. I want you to know those transliterations. And we're going to exercise that on Tuesday. We'll go through exercises of pronunciation, memorization, and transliteration on Tuesday to help you prepare for the exam. And we'll also, while we're at it, begin our study of the accents.